First of all, welcome to everybody. Um, this is the first of our talks on sporting art from the British Sporting Art Trust, the BSAT. As you will know, we've had to cancel our programme of visits to private collections last year, and there's still some uncertainty about visiting private homes this year. First of all, though, uh, I'm not Sally Bills. Um, there's been a power cut in the Suffolk area so Sally has had to give up her job of hosting this uh, Zoom uh, webinar uh, and I've been put in charge uh, and I haven't had any rehearsals. So apologies if there are any technical problems. Um, we've discussed this series uh, and a series like this for a little while, but there is now time for us, I think, to get on with it. Uh, we've had too much discussion and I'm pleased to announce today uh, that Roundtree uh, Trion Gallery of Petworth and St. James's in London has agreed to sponsor these talks for this year. We put together a series of monthly talks for the rest of the year and the generous sponsorship of Roundtree Trion means that uh, we can put on these talks free of charge. I would like to thank Jamie at Roundtree for his generosity and for all the encouragement he's given to us uh, for this uh, programme. I've just received the catalogue of his uh, latest exhibition at Petworth, which will be featuring recent acquisitions that the gallery has made, and that runs from the 6th to the 30th of April. We hope you uh, enjoy uh, this series and encourage your friends and family to join the BSAT and to support our work in promoting sporting arts. The joining details are on our website, bsat.co.uk. Uh, I'll introduce us. Um, I'm Tim Cox, Chairman of the Executive Committee, and Sally Bills, whose name appears on the screen, is our administrator who's put the programme together. And the third talking head is Hannah Clark, who's our speaker today. Before we go on to hear Hannah, I'd just like to mention the BSAT Lionel Edwards exhibition, Lionel Edwards Seen from the Saddle. The exhibition is at the uh, Osborne Studio Gallery from the 13th of April to the 1st of May and then goes on to the Glebe Gallery in Charlton in Wiltshire from the 7th to the 16th of May. This is the first large exhibition of Lionel's work since 1986 and opens on the 55th anniversary of his death. There is also an 80 page catalogue that's been produced with a forward by the Duchess of Cornwall. Uh, you can get the catalogue from Sally. We hope to see you at the exhibition. Because of COVID rules, we do have to operate a booking system. Um, go on to the talk now. Uh, we've invited Hannah to give our first talk. Hannah recently joined the executive committee and has already contributed an essay the American Quest for British Sporting Art, 1870 to 1930. She first came known to us uh, when she spoke at a conference on sporting art in 2015. And then she went on to be a visiting research scholar at Georgetown University, Washington, DC. Before that, she'd been a Klug Fellow of the Library of Congress, Washington, DC, and received a fellowship from the National Sporting Museum and Library in Middleburg, USA. A doctoral thesis was entitled uh, From Melton Mowbray to Middleburg, Transatlantic Dialogues in Fashionable Fox Hunting, 1870 to 1930. Alongside writing and continuing to write articles on field sports for the um, field magazine, she set up her own brand image consultancy, Ormond, which advises luxury brands on how to use uh, their own history to build their brand reputation, comment and positioning. Anna has um, agreed to answer questions at the end of the session. At the bottom of your screen, you'll see a, a button labeled Q&A. The procedure is for you to type in your question there and then I will put the question to Hannah at the end of the session. Uh, I can see the questions coming in uh, as they come in. So on to Hannah. 
Uh, Hannah's talk today is entitled Thoroughly Modern Meltonian, Reevaluating Traditional Depictions of Early 19th Century Fox Hunting in the Historic Hunting Capital of Melton Mowbray, Leicestershire. So over to you, Hannah. Thank you very much, Tim, for your introduction. Right, without further ado, let us begin. Many 19th century depictions of fox hunting are viewed as representing a traditional, rural, unchanging sport that differs little from its medieval origins, with the exception of a shift in the quarry from the deer to the fox. However, I suggest to you today that hunting art shown in the shires, that is the area surrounding the hunting capital of Melton Mowbray, Leicestershire, and the encompassing corn, beaver and Cotsmore hunts, recorded a transformation of the sport in the early 19th century to one which represented modern ideas of masculinity, athleticism, leisure and metropolitan attitudes towards the countryside. Today, I'm briefly going to explore two aspects of that change. Firstly, a change in the hunting landscape, and secondly, a change in the type of huntsman and the betrayal of his body. The Enclosure Acts of the late 18th century resulted in the transformation of the agrarian landscape. Whilst traditional fox hunters saw the new fences, ditches and hedges as impediments to their sport, young metropolitan elites embraced these obstacles as a challenge by which to demonstrate their bravery, skill and athleticism. Thomas Seymour's Going to Cover from 1750 contrasts with the work of Henry Alkin depicting Leicestershire in the 1820s, which shows not only a marked change in the pace of the riders, but also in the hunting landscape and how the hunters traversed it. Seymour's hunters move at a slow canter, whilst Alkin's figures are at a flat out gallop, representing the hard riding Meltonians of the 1820s and 1830s, who hunted to ride rather than rode to hunt. Similarly, Seymour's image depicts an old fashioned hunting landscape of semi woodland, and the riders do not seem to be impeded by obstacles like hedges or ditches. In Alkin's image, the riders and their horses jump a hedge at speed in what was known as a flying leap. More importantly, in Seymour's image, the focus is on the hounds and the skill of navigating the landscape by scent and sound. But in Alkins, the hounds have been relegated from the image in favor of a show of daring horsemanship, suggesting that the focus of the fox hunt had changed the pursuit of speed, glory, and excitement. Similarly, the type of person fox hunting changed rapidly. Earlier 18th century literature and caricatures had cast the country hunter as an uncouth Tory squire and landowner, for instance, Squire Weston and Henry Fielding's Tom Jones, or Joseph Addison's essays in The Freeholder, and caricatures by Rowlandson and Gilray, all reveled in depicting the hunter as bumbling, often drunk and dreadfully old fashioned. I think we can see a little bit in this image here by Rowlandson that we have a rather raucous hunt dinner going on. There's already a lot of alcohol that's been drunk and discarded here. And we have a fox's brush sticking out of one of the hunting goblets here, all in a fairly old fashioned medieval style hall with armor and hunting regalia all around. Yet by the time of Henry Alkin's panorama, a hunting trip to Melton Mowbray, from 1821, young fashionable dandies like Beau Brummel are seen flocking from St. James's Piccadilly, London, to Melton on the new turnpikes, filling the inns and hostelries of the town, just so they could indulge in fox hunting six days a week. These men, known as Meltonians and Corinthians, were celebrated in plays, songs, and print culture in the metropolis as much as they were in the countryside. The hunting fields also became far more accessible Large advances in communication in the form of the new turnpike roads opened up the shires to men from the metropolis in a way that had not been possible before. Critically, between 1811 and 1835, the speed of the mail coach between the metropolis and Melton Mowbray increased by over 40%. Once there, the three hunts were all accessible from the town, offering gentlemen the opportunity to hunt six days a week, more than any other county could offer. The physical changes posed by the new agrarian landscape offered the perfect playground for the fashionable thrusters, as they were known, to demonstrate their modern masculinity. Many of the newly created boundaries in Leicestershire were particularly fearsome, though relished by the riders as an exciting challenge. 
In Franklin's image, going in and out clever from 1821, the Leicestershire landscape is divided by a prototype hedge, what would later become known as a double oxa. It consists of a newly dug ditch, followed by a low bank and a set of rails behind which are planted a row of young blackthorn seedlings and another set of rails which protected the young seedlings from grazing cattle. Such a fence required considerable skill to navigate. And I think we can see fairly clearly that while our rider in the front is successfully doing it, behind him, his companions are not quite successful as he is plowing through the railings or looks like about to fall off backwards in this particular one. In Henry Alkin's print series, How to Qualify for a Meltonian, addressed to all would-be Meltonians from 1821, Alkin illustrates and describes six conspicuous points of Meltonianship. For the plate, How to Ride Down a Hill, he instructs the would-be Meltonian to ride down a hill at top speed, and I quote, however steep it may be, and not to exhibit the most distant sign of fear, as that is very essential feature of Meltonianism. Similarly, he argued, the would-be Meltonian must by nature be endowed of great courage and possess a high-toned set of nerves, but equally importantly, accomplish all the challenges of the countryside with apparent ease and grace and achieve a swing of extreme elegance whilst on horseback. So quite an easy <laughs> thing to accomplish. The early 19th century Meltonian hunter presented his body in a completely different way to those hunters who had preceded him. The dress and form of his body was influenced by new contemporary ideals of the classical body and masculine athleticism, the new military body of the Napoleonic Wars, and the fashions of the young dandies in St. James's, London. These new modern ideals can be interpreted from sporting art of the period. Pierce Egan wrote slightly mockingly that the Meltonians, I quote, jacket, upper tog, Benjamin or greatcoat, was a sporting article of the finest quality in the fashionable throng. Similarly, his hat was positively a thing of taste and his boots, whether Shauna Hayes cut or Hobby's stamp, were the style, the whole style and nothing else but the style. T.J. Rawlins print, The Real Maltonian or The Pleasures of the Chase developed from 1833, similarly reveals that the elite Maltonian sportsman's athleticism and the way he dressed his body was considered superior to that of those in more provincial hunts. The image shows three huntsmen, the old English fox hunter, which is on this side, the real Meltonian in the center, and the common rate sportsman. I think we can see who is dressed to impress on this one. The real Meltonian, his jacket is cut much higher, it's much tighter, he has a very pronounced what was called a pigeon poulter effect which was in fashion at the time where it was all padded at the front to give the impression of a, a large chest and broad shoulders and a narrow waist and long legs which fitted in with the ideal at the time of the classical figure in contrast to the more traditional old English fox hunter with his looser fitting longer frock coat style of, of dress. The modern fashion and style of the early 19th century Meltonian represented in art is also seen in a surviving hunting jacket in the Leicestershire archives dating from 1815 to 1830. Made from red broadcloth, it has a high rolled collar, deep double notch reveres, so here, and gathered shoulders, which were also padded, that were seen in Roland and Alkin's prints. It's also cut away, which was very much the style in the tailcoat at the back. The coat represents a change from 18th century hunting coats, which were formerly country frock coats with little or no differentiation between use for riding and usage for fox hunting. Such garments conformed to the desirable 18th century male body type, which was pear shaped, so small shoulders, and quite often a very rounded and quite large belly by today's standards. The coats also followed co the colors of the countryside. We can see here this drab color which blended in with a lot of the trees and natural elements of the countryside. They offer in shades of green and drab, which are more suited for stalking animals than loudly chasing them. James Seymour's painting of Mr. Russell and a Bay Hunter from 1740 shows such a coat in use. The short, tight cut of the Meltonian jacket corresponded to a new ideal of body shape based upon the athletic classical male body at this time you had the neoclassical revival going on. 
the Apollo Belvedere sculpture was held up as the male idea and the fashionable hunter and London dandies tried to emulate his physique to dress in the early 19th century. This male dressed form became an abstraction of nude, excuse me, an abstraction of nude form and attempted to draw associations with antique heroic nudity. In addition, the military body and the martial spectacle of the Napoleonic Wars also changed the Meltonian dress to the cut of the garment, connotations of bravery, virility, gallantry, and the idea of a uniform. In, partic in particular, the adoption of scarlet, as it was known at the time, as the predominant color for hunting coats from around 1800 onwards points to a link with the military dress of the Napoleonic Wars and a desire for an equally distinctive and visually powerful hunt identity. The Stroud Water Scarlet Cavalry Twill or Broadcloth used for both costumes was probably produced by the same mills in the Stroud Valley in Gloucestershire and many, many military tailors in London and Savile Row were also suppliers of hunting dress. The vain Maltonian may also have tried to copy the military's posture and athletic form in other ways. Men in uniform, in particular officers of the cavalry, were reputed to wear corsets. Hunting belts were sold in the 1830s by the Indian rubber web depot in Regent Street, one called the Meltonian Riding and Cricketing Belt, offered both abdominal support and, I quote, improvement of the physique. If they were regularly worn by the hunt, it might explain why when jumping, unlike today when the forward seat is advocated, the men are shown hailing a cab or throwing their weight backwards with one arm raised behind them. Obviously, this was partly for balance, but the wearing of stays would also have made bending forward at the waist considerably more difficult. Hunting uniform also owed something to dandy fashions. In print number nine of Henry's panorama, a hunting trip to Melton Mowbray, this detail shows all the riders wearing an approximation of Beau Brummel's fashion as they prepare to mount at the meet. One Meltonian has his servant hold a mirror whilst he just, here we go, here, hold a mirror whilst he tries to replicate Beau Brummel's famous necktie, but actually the necktie from the dandy culture is often one of the, or credited to be one of the origins of the hunting stock or the military stock. So a lot of hunters at this time also wore black military stocks to hunt in. And it's only late, latterly that the cream one came into, into the main, main fashion. And we also see in this, this corner here, one of um, the valets is putting on the famous top boots, which are being polished for him. Um, I know that Barry Rommel famously said that he would polish these top boots to get the lovely color at the top with champagne and apricot jam. Alongside of this, 19th century art also reveals modern changes in saddlery, headgear, boots, and horse and hound breeding. These images reveal that Alcan was a chronicler of the minute of contemporaneous sporting life that were far more than the humorous depictions of the Leicestershire hunting world. I suggest that he was also showing us a commentary on a sport that was rapidly transforming and far from being the traditional depiction of hunting, which we believe it is today, was a was actually a radical departure from the hunting art and style of hunting that preceded it. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, Hannah. Um, one of the, uh, as I said at the beginning, if anybody's got questions, then, uh, please use the Q&A button at the bottom of right of the screen. Um, one question I do have, Hannah, you don't mention women uh, or women fashioned in hunting at this time. Uh, what was going on? Were the women hunting? Uh, were they riding side saddle? What thoughts? At this point in time, there's actually very, very few women hunting, particularly in, in Melton. Melton was known as a place that was not suitable for high class women. Uh, it was, if you think of it in the context at this time, part of the impetus behind Melton becoming the sporting centre was because a lot of the young men who would have gone on the grand tour to let off steam and have a, what we would now call a gap year, weren't able to do so because of the Napoleonic Wars. Melton became their playground and there was a lot of bad behavior, drinking, um, the term painting the town red 
comes from this period where they were drinking a lot in the evening and getting up to all types of antics. So the women who were around this area at the time, who were in Melton, often were women of ill repute. It was not a suitable place to bring your wife and children. That only starts to come in with the beginnings of the railways later where you start to see women come in and riding side saddle and Melton transforms into this much more genteel place to live. Um, and there's a lot more building at this time of hunting lodges specifically, not only for bachelor young men, but also for families and women to be there in acceptable circumstances. So at this time, one of the most famous uh, female hunters was called Skittles, who was actually a courtesan who scandalized society by wearing very tight riding habits and sometimes riding astride, but she was very much the exception. Worth another study later, I should think. Yes. <laughs> uh, we do have one question. Uh, how did uh, saddlery and horse equipment change um, over this time? Did it become sleeker to represent the speed that the horses were going at? Very much so. Um, so previous to this and the, the, the older style of hunting that we, we saw with Seymour's work, we had saddles which were much more the very high saddle cantle at the front and the back which held you in and would, have, would you weren't really able to jump on them, jump in them, sorry, because your legs would be held straight. When you start getting obstacles in the landscape in terms of these hedges and drainage ditches, um, you weren't physically able to jump and, and, and bend your legs enough. So the saddle becomes a lot flatter to allow for jumping. You remove that very high cantle at the front and the stirrups become shorter. Likewise, you end up with um, bitting changes. You've gone from very long shanks on the bit to much shorter ones. And because the style of horse has changed as well, you, you end up with the, the thoroughbred race horse starts to come in because this is all about speed at this point. The young men, in effect, their, their horses, their hunting horses were their equivalent of a Ferrari at that point. You wanted to be able to go as fast as you could and jump at speed. It really wasn't in this particular area of, of the country about showing the hounds working. It was about daring horsemanship. Um, so everything was built for speed, as you said, to be sleek, to allow for jumping, and everything becomes a lot more streamlined, which also then changes things like the boots that people would have worn. So prior to that, your top boots actually went over the top of your, your knees up into your thighs. And again, to allow for jumping, they would be turned down, which is where you get that distinctive paler color around a traditional hunting top boot as well. So things are changing. What had the the, um, uh, the countryside around Melton? Did it lend itself to the new form of hunting? Is that why it grew, or were there other reasons why Melton became the centre? It's partly due to the topography. So you have the proximity of three hunts nearby: the corn, the beaver, and the Cotsmoor who all offered hunting, which would allow you to hunt for six days a week. And Melton was an epicenter and the turnpikes from London and some of the other cities allowed for quick access to Melton. It's also partly because at this time, the rolling landscape of Leicestershire wasn't particularly heavily wooded. Um, so it lended itself quite well to allowing for these long, this, the, speed, the new ideal of speed and, and and um, long gallops, which were prized at that point, a long chase. And because Leicestershire had quite heavy clay soils, it wasn't very good for growing wheat and other types of agrarian um, crops. It was put down to pasture a lot of the time, which again made it ideal for allowing for, for galloping and, and for hunting. And a lot of the landowners in the area were amenable to allow the hunt to access in ways that they was a little more difficult in certain other areas of the country. Uh, one of the questions that's come in, um, where did the horses come from? Did you see a change in the market for horses? Were they um, coming in for Ireland, for example? 
I'm not aware at this point they're coming in from Ireland. Um, it seems to be there was, um, forgive me, I can't remember the name, but London was a big basis for horse trading and for, for hunters at that point. And a lot of them were, again, as I said, of thoroughbred stock, more so than they would be now. Um, so I'm, I'm not aware that Ireland was the epicenter. It, it's an era I don't know so much about. I think if you wanted to learn a bit more about it, Donna Landry has written on the thoroughbred horse and she's actually traced back at this time the different breeding and uh, origins of a lot of the horses coming into Britain and being used for different sports, whether racing, hunting or um, other equestrian pursuits. Have you uh, done a, a study of the sporting art and how that changed? Um, did the market change? Was there a, an increase in the number of prints available to yeah. reflect this uh, changing um, form of hunting? Yes, yeah, so this is the kind of a, a real golden age, I think, for, for hunting print culture, um, as it was for the print culture in general with people like Gilray and Rowlandson. Um, you had at this point Ackerman Galleries, which was uh, a large draw and destination for the people interested in sporting prints. You had s &J Fuller, you had Thomas McLean. And these were all very much in the centre around St. James's in the West End of London, which is also where young men who were hunting were living. And then that's where they get their outfits made, a lot of the traditional clothing outfitters that we still know today, like Lock & Co, that would have been supplying them, Mayor and Mortimer, Henry Poole, are still in existence today. So the hunt culture was actually very metropolitan in a way. It wasn't just something you did in the countryside. It was actually brought back into the city. Um, and these men were celebrated. They were seen as the young, desirable sportsmen of the day. There were plays put on about them with live fox hunts live fox hunts actually in the London theatre. So this print culture was very popular um, and there was multiple runs of some of this print culture. The, I would say it becomes at this period, there is more of a disposable culture you're seeing in print as opposed to, as obviously oil paintings as well, but it's accessible in a way that it perhaps wasn't before. Um, and we start to see it appearing, how it's hung in the, in the houses as well changes. Previous to this, sporting art had been mainly hung in the dining room or the entrance hall alongside, in the entrance hall alongside, it would have been armour and things depicting the defence of the house and the, the, the idea of the countryside being brought in. At this point, with these prints, they start to appear in studies, they start to appear in, in rooms that were previously not associated with, with sporting art and would be mixed with, with trophies of the hunt. They might be mixed with non-sporting art as well. Uh, when did the Americans start to come over to hunt? Was that much later? Yes, so the 1870s is one of the, the crucial points where Americans start to come over. There's a, there's a few examples before then, um, but that's when the technology really allows for it. So you have the, the rise of the transatlantic steam liners allowing fairly regular and relatively fast service between New York and Liverpool or New York and Southampton. And they start to come, initially it was a, it was a key way actually for Americans to integrate themselves into British aristocratic society trying to get into the court of St. James's, needed invitations, but the hunting field was a relatively open way to be mixing. So a lot of them came to London in huge numbers. Um, and this is also a time when you have a lot of what were called the dollar, American dollar brides marrying into the British aristocracy. And a large number of them came to hunt with that one aim in mind. So Melton became this huge center for American society and right up to the most famous example later, which was, it was Wallace Simpson, who managed to snare Edward VIII whilst in, she was hunting in Melton, so was he. Right. <laughs> there was a lot going on. I, I attended a lecture recently 
and Michael Clayton, the ex-editor of Horse and Hound, referred to the Meltonians of the 1830s as the Ferrari drivers of the time and the thought of red cars and red hunting gear uh, seemed extremely appropriate at the time that you know the love of speed and showing off um, so Ferrari drivers has always stuck in my mind as a good description of what a Meltonian was at the time. Absolutely the uh, <laughs> I think they they were just interested in speed a lot of the time, much to the annoyance of those hunters who were interested in a more traditional form, which is a little slower, and looking at the hound's work and, and understanding the scent and the lay of the land. Um, there's lots of complaints about them behaving badly both on and off the field. But it was all about speed. And you've got that kind of showing through at the time in bigger picture, which is the railways are coming, that's about speed, the turnpikes are increasing speed across the country. It was this kind of general impetus that was happening and I think it fed into the pursuit of the style of new style of fox hunting that was happening in the shires and is seen in the sporting art that you start to see now with everything being depicted about speed and daring do's on, on the hunting field. Right. Uh, we've answered, uh, all, or I've asked all the questions that have been posed via the Q&A system. Uh, there might be some frustration of using the new system, but I hope uh, we get that sorted out. Um, we scheduled these talks to last for about half an hour. We thought that uh, the right amount of time. I'd like to thank Hannah uh, for the time that she's given in preparing the talk and for giving it to us uh, this morning. Uh, it's very much appreciated. Uh, and just remind, uh, uh, and I also like to thank Jamie Roundtree again uh, for sponsoring these um, uh, lectures for the rest of the year. Uh, I hope by then Sally Bills will have got electricity back into Suffolk and will be able to join us and also manage the system a little better than I've been able to do. Uh, I was only warned about five minutes before we came on air uh, that she wasn't going to be able to join us. So uh, thank you everybody for joining us uh, this morning. Thank you, Hannah. Uh, and also remind everybody that the exhibition Lionel Edwards, Seen from the Saddle, uh, will be at the Osborne Studio Gallery from the 13th of April um, uh, until the 1st of May and then goes on to the Glebe Gallery uh, in Wiltshire uh, for the 7th to the 14th of uh, May. So thank you very much uh, and hope to see you next time. We are going to, we have a schedule now uh, that every third Thursday of the rest of the year we will have a BSA talk on some aspect of sporting art. So thank you everybody for joining us this morning. Thank you. Thank you.